where we left off yesterday, we were looking at ranks of sets inside the V hierarchy. So just to remind us then, what we were looking at there on the V hierarchy was the following. We draw V here as a kind of cone of sets with the ordinals going up as a kind of spine. And then off it, we define these levels V alpha here. And this we did by starting off at the empty set, we construct everything out of the empty set. Each next level is the power set of the one below. And at a limit stage, we take the union. And then our universe of sets is everything that I can get in this way. And in some sense, it is everything because <laughs> we throw in the, all the possible subsets of V alpha to get to the next stage. So it's hard to imagine kind of something that's missing, right? If we throw in the whole power set here. <clears throat> I mean, it does impose a structure on the universe of sets. It ensures that the epsilon relation is well-founded. Right? So we'll look at the kind of consequences of that today. <clears throat> So, but let's just say a little bit more about ranks again. We saw, or we defined the rank of a set X. This was the least alpha, such that X is a subset of V alpha. So all of its elements occur, occur before the alpha stage here. And this is also the least alpha, such that X is a member of V alpha plus one. Here. Because that's all V alpha plus one is. It's the power set of V alpha. And we also saw in Lemma 6.2, all of these V alpha levels are transitive and they accumulate. And in fact, V beta is a subset of V alpha. And we saw examples of various ranks of sets here. Basically, a rank of a singleton set of X is the rank of X plus one. Right? So the maxim was you put a pair of brackets around the set to make a singleton set you raise the rank by one. And again, this is because if X is a member of V alpha plus one, right, singleton X is then a subset of V alpha plus one. So it's a member of V alpha plus two. So we raise the rank by one here. And we saw, for example, something like this, And if you just look and see what you've got, this is going to be the rank of the larger of the two ranks of X and Y plus two because of the extra brackets we put around. So it's the maximum of these two plus two. Now exercise 6.1 that I set, it's the homework, um, just to save the marker, um, I'm going to do two now. So just do parts one and three. I said on the 
course web page do all of 6.1. I just, I just let, listed 6.1, but let's do 6.2 now. So omit 2 because we're going to do 2 now. Show that the rank of the big union of X is less than or equal to the rank of X. And you're asked to give examples of when we have equals and non-equals here. Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. <laughs> what is the rank of X? It's the level in the hierarchy here where all the members of X have appeared. So perhaps here are the elements of X strung out and they've all appeared by level V alpha. So perhaps X is contained in V alpha. So this is what the rank of X is less than or equal to alpha. And if alpha is least where X is a subset of V alpha, then we've got equality here. But we also had, right, if y is a member of x, then the rank of y is less than the rank of x. Because if y is one of the elements here, y is here because all of its elements occur yet further down, down here. So if y is an element of x, its rank is less than that of x in this picture, alpha. So what is this big union here? It's a set of elements of elements of x. Okay, but if I pick an element of x, it's got smaller rank. And if I then pick an element of that, it's got yet smaller rank. So actually, it's fairly obvious that the rank of anything in here is going to be less than or equal to the rank of the whole set. If Z is in Y is in X, then I've got that the rank of Z is less than the rank of Y is less than the rank of X. So these are the Z's that make up this here. So if all the elements of X occur by stage alpha, then all of these, the elements of any Y that's in X have occurred by stage alpha. And that's true for all of the Y's that are in X. So I think you can just say, hence the rank of the big union of X, which is a collection of these Z's, this is going to be less than or equal to the rank of X. So the question asks for examples. find um, x1 and x2 with the rank of big union of x1 being strictly less than the rank of x1 and for the rank of big union of x2 to be equal to the rank of x2. Okay, so that needs to consider that perhaps for a bit. So perhaps the easier one is X2. 
Take X2, let this be just the set of evens. So it's a subset of omega. And we know that each of these is in the VN hierarchy. Right? So each natural number is in V omega. So X2 is a subset of V omega. And so its rank here is less than or equal to omega by definition of rank. But actually there's no finite Vn which contains all of the numbers because that Vn would then be infinite and that's not the case. Each Vn is finite. So the rank being less than omega is impossible. As each Vn is finite. So the rank is exactly omega. And of course that accords with our intuition, right? That it's a subset of V omega, nothing smaller. And the evens are then a member of V omega plus one. But now, if you just look at the, what is the big union of X2, it's a set of members, members of X2, it's just omega. Right? And of course, this is for the same reason, it's a subset of V omega, so the rank of omega is omega. So in this case, we've got the rank of X2 is the same as the rank of big union of X2. Okay. So let's take rank of Let's take X1 to be the set omega itself. So it's just got one element. Okay. This here is a subset of V omega plus one. Okay. So the rank of this X1 is omega plus one. The set omega, just omega, doesn't occur at any earlier level. So omega is not a member of any V omega or Vn. So its rank of this singleton cannot be less than omega plus one. So now let's look at big union of X1. Sorry, omega. So it's a set of elements of elements of omega. This is just omega here. And we saw what the rank of this was. And that's less than the rank of X1. And this is part of a general phenomenon, which is sort of asking you, asks you to characterize those sets for which the rank of the union is less than the rank of Z.
Well, in general, it's just as what we've seen here. If the rank of some y here is a limit or not, then the rank of big union of y is the rank of y. Here we had before the set of evens, right? And its rank was omega. On the other hand, then if the rank is a successor, then it's smaller. For the same reason that we for, saw with a singleton omega here at the successor stage here. So, and if the rank of y is, say, some delta plus one, then the rank of big union of y here will be delta. So it's rather like, you know, if y is a set of ordinals with the largest element, then big union of y, right, is that largest element. Whereas if y has no maximum element, big union of y is that supremum. Same kind of phenomenon there. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, somebody asks, why is the union of X2 omega here? Let's check. Big union of X2 is omega. <coughs> so X2 was, no, sorry, evens here. Right, so each natural number is the set of its predecessors. Right. So any element of an element of an even is a natural number. So this is kind of clear. Pick a number in omega, and then there's an even number bigger than it. Let m be evens here with n less than m. <clears throat> and then well, pick two evens. If n is less than m1, which is less than m2, Then N here is a member. Sorry, I don't need to do this. <laughs> Making it too complicated. Let M1 be an even. With N less than M1, which is an even. So N is then a member. It is a member of a member of even. So N is a member of big union of the evens. So N was arbitrary.
So we're done. Um, somebody asks about the big union of the empty set. Well, this is just the empty set. The rank of the empty set, it's true, is zero. So that's neither a successor nor a limit, right? But it sort of like acts like a limit in this case, right? the rank of the set is the same as the rank of its big union. Okay. So it's uh, very useful to have all of our sets in this hierarchy, laid out in this kind of uh, well-ordered fashion, or at least linear fashion. The set theorists think that's so useful that they um, adopt an axiom that ensures it. So I'm now talking to the top of page 62. So we adopt an axiom which ensures all our sets fall into this V hierarchy. So they're laid out nicely. In this V alpha hierarchy. And this is the last axiom of some Mello Frankel set theory that we're going to consider. Well, it's the last axiom that there is. We've considered all of the others. So we say that every set is well founded. By epsilon. So officially, if X is a non empty set. There should be an epsilon element of X, which is minimal. So there is a Y in X, such that X intersect Y is empty. So just pause for a moment and see why this is makes Y epsilon minimal. Right? We found a Y in the epsilon relation to X. What this says is there are no epsilon members of Y that are epsilon in X. So there are no elements of Y that are in X. So Y is epsilon minimal there in X. So one way to say this is to say every set X has an epsilon minimal element. So to paraphrase, every non-empty set has an epsilon minimal element. Not a minimum because X may not be well ordered by epsilon, right? It may be a partial order. So maybe like a tree, it may have lots of roots. So it may have lots of different minimal elements. But 
But what we are doing is ruling out by fiat sets x with x a member of x, like this. Or with x a member of y a member of x. Kind of chains or cycles like this. I mean, perhaps if we had something like this, Here I've got x as an element of x, in this case. But now there is no epsilon minimal element of x here. The only element of x is x itself, right? So this here would be, I mean, this is like saying x intersect here is x itself, right? But it's got a smaller element, epsilon further down, which is in here. And then there's another one further down, another one further down, which is just x, 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 x right? here. So the axiom of foundation rules out this kind of situation here. So we'll see more of this uh, in a moment. Okay, so any questions about the axiom? So I sorry, um so would this axiom now apply throughout the whole of the course? Like in an exam question. Yes. Would we always assume it? Yes, you would. Okay, because there's been questions before where we have seen like x element of y element of x. So Correct. questions like that just not come up or? Well, no, if, if there was a question about that kind of relationship, right, then that would not be assuming the axiom. Right? I mean, at the beginning of the course, we didn't assume the axiom. And yes, we, we looked at situations like this. We looked to see how we could define ordered pairing sensibly. You know, there were different ways and one could define ordered pairing assuming that this doesn't occur perhaps a simpler way than we did. But there at that point, we weren't using this axiom of foundation. In fact, you know, we've not really used it very much at all. Um, I don't think we've had any secret hidden uses of the axiom. So we can okay. save it and introduce it at the end. Right? Okay, thank you. Okay, so the following are equivalent. One, this axiom of foundation. And then the fact that for every x, there is an alpha, where x is in a V alpha hierarchy. And for every x, there is an alpha such that x is a subset of V alpha. So if this is true, this lemma, the axiom of foundation forces all of our sets to be in this V hierarchy, right? which is good, which is what we want. We then get a nice picture of um, all the sets that there are. So let's prove this. So we cycle through um, implications, one implies two, implies three, implies one. So we assume an axiom of foundation. So we assume the axiom of foundation. So 
almost an argument by cases. Look at the transitive closure of X. Right? Perhaps this is a subset of V. Right? And for some ordinal alpha, TCX is contained in V alpha. So why? If TCX is contained in alpha. I can look at the rank function applied to TCX. So what I've got here is a set and I've implying this function to it. So this is a set of ordinals. by our axiom of replacement. So I can just look at it supremum. So for some alpha, the rank of TCX is, these are ordinals are all less than alpha. So that means TCX is contained in V alpha. Okay, so this is all under this if assumption here. But in this case, we'd be done. Right? So if this were the case, we'd be done because I've got that X is a subset of TCX. And now this is a subset of V alpha. <laughs> so now I've got that X is a subset of V alpha. So X is a member of V alpha plus one. And that's all we needed was to find some ordinal such that X was in V of that ordinal. So that's under this, this hypothesis. Okay, so suppose that fails. So suppose on the other hand, TCX is not all contained in there. So V, there are sets in, sorry, other way around. Look at TCX. And there are things in TCX that are not in V, right? TCX is not all contained in V. Okay, now I deploy the axiom of foundation. This is not empty. Find a Y in here, which is epsilon minimal. Find a Y in TCX, which is not in V here. But whose intersection with here is empty which is what the axiom is saying, just to remind us. We can find a Y whose intersection with the set under consideration is empty. Okay, so the Axon Foundation guarantees us that there is such here. So then 
any z that's in y, right, here, is going to be in TCX, right? So any set that's in here, right, is going to be in Y, it's going to be in TCX, right? But on the other hand, it will be in V because it's epsilon below Y. Okay. So any Z that's in Y, so epsilon below Y, right here intersect tcx which is not in v right? tcx minus v here so this is epsilon below y right sorry uh, i'm saying this this badly i'm saying okay But then any z that's in y here sorry sorry let me i've just um okay let's get rid of this here let me back up in that case that is, Assuming TCX minus V is non-empty. So by the axiom of foundation, I can find a Y that's in here, right? So it's in TCX and, but it's not in V. Okay, but on the other hand, it, this is epsilon minimal in here. So it has empty intersection with this, which is what I've written here. But now if I pick any z in y, right? Right, if y is a member of TCX, so is z in TCX, right? But because it's epsilon minimum in here, right? That z in y is going to be in TCX, but it has to be then in V. So this is what I should have said. Any z in y, is in TCX, Because right? Y is a member of TCX, implies it's a subset. So any Z that's in here is in TCX. But because Y intersect this set is empty, Z has to be in V. as y is epsilon minimal. In TCX less V. So what have we got? Y, all of its elements are in V. So now I argue just as in the first case, the rank function applied to Y is a set of ordinals. Say all less than beta. So that means Y is contained in V beta, but that means it's in V beta plus one. But Y was chosen to be not in V, right? And here we have just reason that it is in V. So this is a contradiction. So this case doesn't occur.
So this case doesn't occur. And we must then have that um, for any set X, TCX is contained in V. And so X must be in some V alpha plus one for some alpha. So that concludes one implies two. And the other directions are then a little easier. Right? Two arrows, three. If X is a member of V alpha, we've seen that the V alphas are transitive. So two implies three is, well, given that the V alphas are transitive is kind of trivial. Three implies one is also easy. If I've got X, which is a subset of V alpha, right, then I can I can think of rho applying it to X epsilon. This is going into the ordinals, alpha less than. So rho of y is some ordinal less than alpha here. So this is order preserving. Right. Recall that if y is a member of z, then rho of y is always less than rho z. That's why it's order preserving. And then you can just check. Any z0 in x right, with least rank least amongst the collection of all ranks of Z for Z in X here is also epsilon minimal. That is, we have that Z zero intersect X is empty. Because if it was non-empty, there'd be something with yet smaller rank right? that contradicts the choice of it as being least. Right? That's X with the epsilon relation is well founded. Okay, so that finishes that whole loop there. Finishes the lemma. Okay, uh, any questions there? Somebody asked for the last page. Uh, not sure how much of the last page, whether that's now too late. Okay, got it. Good.
Okay, so there's a little more to do on uh, ranks here. Um, so this is important stuff, I'd say, on page 63. So please do this. It'll be in the recorded lecture. Uh, let me just finish by saying, looking at um, uh, question that might arise. You might think, why do I believe that all sets are in the V hierarchy? Right? I mean, you're entitled to ask, <clears throat> Are all mathematical structures in in the V hierarchy? I mean, is it really sufficient for for mathematics, right? Just to consider sets in V. It's a perfectly legitimate question, right? and I think exercise six four shows that the answer is essentially yes. At least if we assume the well ordering principle. So, for example, suppose I've got a group. What is a group? It's a domain, there's a multiplication, there's an identity, and there's an inverse. Then the exercise says show. There is an isomorphic copy of G in V. So there's some G bar here, which is isomorphic to G, with G bar here in the V hierarchy. So we use WP for this. So let me just sketch the solution. We use WP just to find so that we've got a, a well ordering of this domain G here. Because there's a well order, it's isomorphic to an ordinal. So this justifies that there is a function f from g bijectively with some ordinal. Now alpha is in v. So we'll see this next time. In fact, alpha is a member of V alpha plus one. We'll see, it's the next lemma. But now I can copy these relations from this domain onto alpha. And I can get a new group G bar with domain alpha. relations and functions of G onto a new group G bar, whose domain is going to be alpha. And I'm going to have a multiplication for G bar and an identity for G bar and an inverse for G bar which are just given by the, given to me by the function, the function G, uh, the function F. Right? So the details of how you get this thing here 
these are just sketched in this solution sheet here. So I'll just stop before I go on for too long. So just see the solution sheet. For more details. But now this G bar is in V. We construct something here, where the domain is something in V, and here we've got various subsets of this ordinal in V here. So this is a binary relation on alpha, right? The identity is a constant function. Here's a one place function on alpha. These things here are all in V. So basically I've got this isomorphic copy of the group that you gave me in V. And mathematicians, you know, they don't really care what the domain of a group is, right? As long as you have something that's isomorphic to it, you know, the theorems work up to isomorphism. So an isomorphic copy of the group is as good as the group itself. Right? So no mathematician is going to be fussed about then whether the G is something that sits inside V or out. You can always find an isomorphic copy in V. So V in this sense then is sufficient, for example, for group theory, right? We don't restrict ourselves in group theory by insisting all of our groups are in V. Okay, so that's enough for that for now. Okay, so do please look at the next and last lecture, which is going to be recorded on the lemmas six, five and six, six, which will be um, uh, important ones for us.